it was almost like the machine designed itself. Uh huh. You know, there was a, there was enough of a, um, how can you say? Consensus. A consensus. Yeah. 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 And also uh, restraint. Uh huh. Uh, and but it was a, the design appropriately expressed the character of, of the beast. You know. Right. Yeah. And but also without. Uh, adding unnecessary stuff. You know, obviously there was a lot of little eye candy that would make s suggestions, you know, like the connections between the, or the the angled louvers to to give that impression of the interlinking of knuckles and whatnot. Uh -huh. But it was all very appropriate. Even those very subtle details and the the I don't want to call egg crate, but the the venting on top, mm -hmm. um, everything really tied together. Yeah. You know? And uh, it was I still remember the picture of Danny in Time magazine, and there was some statement uh, about you know how different it looked. You know? uh -huh. But it was something like, but of course, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you know. And and I think it really reached the goal of making. Uh, very unique statement. And I remember there were a few other supercomputers that were done at the time. And to me, after going through what we did, um, people would put like a, a little roof on top of it just to have some uh -huh. some kind of unique quality to it, which yeah. totally went went against the, the values, I think, that we all had collectively, which was... Yeah to evolve something really appropriate to the character of the machine. Something that evolved out of what the machine was, what it did, how it was different, and that nothing that was decorative in that sense. I mean, yeah. I think we all really still hewed to the uh, to that aesthetic of of saying it shouldn't be it shouldn't be gussified, it shouldn't be decorated sure. in any way. You know, and it's funny that you mentioned the Bauhaus, but I think a lot of time people think of the Bauhaus as a style, but it's really a thought process. And I think it's a, still today a great thought process, and it shouldn't be confused with style. And I think in some ways it really reflects that very rigorous process of eliminating the unnecessary, you yeah, know, and yeah. just highlighting what is essential. And yeah. I think that's that's really what the machine was about. For me, there was one place where we were stepping out of that, and that was because we were talking about wanting to convey some sort of emotional relationship to this machine, what it meant to us as as engineers, what it meant to us as people building the connection machine, what it meant to scientists who were dreaming about uh, machine intelligence, about creating a... Uh, a thinking machine and it was really only when I started writing the article, the design article on the, uh, I called it the design of the connection machine actually in 91 after the machine was uh, no longer being produced that I took the time to go and research form follows function thinking that it was from one of the Bauhaus no, it's uh, yeah. It was Louis Sullivan. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Who is known for his decorative <laughs> exactly. buildings? Yeah, and all of this, all of this very fine uh, decoration on 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 the buildings. So that really blew me away. How this phrase "form follows function" could go through such a transformation from Louis Sullivan, who thought of the uh, the functional form, the the actual usage, but also the the decorative aspect of his buildings as expressing the emotional relationship to the building for the, you know, the, the, the builders of the building, the owners of the building, the users of the building, in exactly actually the way that we were using this sort of emotional relationship between the connection machine and sure. the builders and users of, of the machine and how how this meaning of of this emotional relationship also being part of the function of a building or a machine could become completely lost and I don't even know if the Bauhaus people used the 
phrase form follows function. No, I don't think so. But it became mm -hmm. attributed to their type of, so to speak, very sober, uh, reduced design. And that might be a very interesting to, thing to pursue in, in design history. How, how be, did that phrase become associated so strongly in the mind of a, vi a very broad, not only public, but also um, architects who I would ask, where did this come from? They sure. would also say, well, maybe Marcel Breuer, or maybe, you know, they would always name someone from the Bauhaus. Sure. So, so that sort of transition, and, and then our, um, our saying, well, form follows function, but we still feel the need to express the emotional connection in the design and and in essence the fact that the functionality was invisible uh, have, making us have to go to a level of abstraction in order to do that the abstraction of the of, of visualizing the hypercube of visualizing the cloud of lights sure of visualizing the the processors uh, working as as their status lights blinked on and off no, and th this is really interesting. I remember I got Danny to come out to Aspen to mm -hmm. to give a talk, and I still rem I remember to this day. He he talks about the beginning uh, prebiotic states, and you know uh, lightning and the chemicals in the water, and suddenly you have uh, unicellular things happening, and you know, and and then he went through this whole evolution thing. And I remember he gets to talking about people and he said, you know, I love my dog, but I can't tell it a good joke. And meaning that there are levels of our understanding that we can't comprehend beyond. You know? yeah. And the computer should not be feared, but it should be something that we do accept as an extension of ourselves. And I then I realized that this is really a perfect way of talking about the thinking machine because there was a, a, an effort as you're talking about a, a real effort to make an emotional connection and uh, although it was black and sleek and you know some people love black porsches and <laughs> oh, i mean there's something about that uh, but there was indeed a, a an acceptance an easier acceptance than just a a white vanilla box being painted you know yeah. it's something new something about the future and uh, not sinister at all just just what it is you know yeah. the sinister part of it uh, that was very explicit from from danny saying he wanted it to be my height five foot three so that was that right i exactly, didn't know that yes that was uh, one of the design criteria uh, that, that he said he wanted to hold because that was then slightly below the eye level of your sort of generic white American male, which meant that it would be, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't superhuman. It was somehow, you know, it was not human, but it was somehow in the range of not only humans, but slightly smaller. Human humans. scale. Human, we always, human scale, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but slightly, or if you want to, slightly smaller than uh, human scale, so it wouldn't be oppressive yeah. in that way. Yeah. And, and you know that, um, that Ted Bilodeau actually went through quite a lot of conniptions with the with the uh, air cooling design in order to fit it into that height of a package. Isn't that interesting? So it I wasn't no actually idea. easy, um, and uh, in order to hold that really as a as a height limit. Wow, and I can imagine with all of the, at least I from what I understand about getting to the inside, having to open it up. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of mechanical stuff that also has to work extremely well, just getting at the connections. And Yeah, it was yeah. actually pretty, I, th I think, pretty easy once uh, once we came up with this, you know, pushing the yeah. two back cubes to the side. Right. Um, you know, I did the I did the first cabling mock-up and, and that's, uh, and that was also preserved in the CM1, CM2, so, you know, uh, you're you're standing in the middle of the machine, and you've you've got then all of the black backplanes, all of the cables for the higher levels of the hypercube dimensions, around around you. But yeah, it was a pretty compact. I was going to say, though. yeah, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. You know? But uh, yeah. I, 
And it's very clear that if, uh, if you know, Danny and Cheryl hadn't from the beginning said, uh, we're willing to put out extra time, effort, and money in order to have a machine where you can lead someone into the computer room and, and tell them, hey, you've never seen a computer like this in your life. You open the door, they step inside, and their first thought, uh, thought is, my God, I've never seen a computer like this in my life. Sure. So, you know, it was a, it was a very, very considerate decision. And I don't know if it would have happened if, for instance, it had been an IBM machine or a, or a Cray or, or whatever. 